Well, good morning to you. I trust you all are doing well and uh, enjoying the sunny weather. <laughs> Not so today, but it has been great, hasn't it? It's been awesome, and uh, we need to rejoice when the Lord gives sun, and we need to rejoice when the Lord taketh away. Amen? Let's open our Bibles to um, 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, <clears throat> and we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 7. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and we will be sure to get one to you. 1 John chapter 2. This is a, a, an amazing letter that John has written, and we're going to look at a number of verses here this morning that um, they can appear a little bit scattered and fragmented, and uh, uh, so we're going to have to focus. I'll try to do a good job of, of helping you focus on the particular part that we're going to be looking at. We're going to actually be looking at four different areas of what John is saying here in these verses. We're going to be looking at this this old and new commandment that he is talking about. We're going to look at this clear contrast that he makes between light and darkness. And then we're going to spend a little time looking at the principle of love being the evidence of our faith. And then we're going to wind uh, things up by looking at some reasons, more reasons for him writing the epistle, focusing specifically on the importance of abiding in the Word, having the Word abide in us, and us abiding in Christ, and Christ uh, abiding in us. There's 105 verses in this epistle, in this letter. We oftentimes refer to uh, the various books of the Bible as books, and to some extent they are, but, but I'm always reminded that we need to be careful that we don't lose sight of the fact that these are actually letters. They're letters that were written to various churches, various uh, people, and in this particular case, it's a letter, a divinely inspired letter that was written to Christians, written to uh, believers. And so be sure that as you're, as you're reading through these that you don't get caught up into chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, but that you really see this as this continuous uh, letter. It's, it's really a love letter as John, who's known as the beloved apostle, he actually uses the word love, agape love, the unconditional sacrificial love of God towards mankind. <clears throat> he uses uh, that word, a uh, Greek word agape, some 46 times alone in uh, 1 John. It's an amazing book. We've, we've covered 16 uh, verses thus far. And what we're really looking at is, is John is writing, John the apostle who uh, is the only one who, of all the apostles who died a natural death, and he's, he's writing for a couple of reasons, and the first we, we looked at already, and that is that our joy would be made full. God desires that in the midst of challenging times in which we live, that, that we would have fullness of joy. And then he, he also writes, and he's developing a very clear contrast between believers which we'll see today that he describes as those walking in light and unbelievers as those who are walking in darkness. And the reason that he makes this clear distinction is because he's wanting the reader to know, the recipient to know, that there are false teachers that are out there. I mean, it is not long. Anytime you're moving closer towards the Lord, the enemy is going to crank up ways to draw you away from the truth into false teaching. And a lot of what he is writing of here is speaking to those false teachers. Now, there's not a whole lot to be said about what's going on with, with unbelievers that he's writing to, but we see a number of things that we've already addressed here in the last few weeks in the first 16 verses, characteristics, if you will, of believers or of Christians, and then characteristics of 
of non-Christians. Of Christians, here's what he says. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're one who desires to have Christ abide in you and you in him, then we can consider these things that we've already learned, and that is we have the truth. As Christians in Christ, we have the truth. We've been cleansed from sin through the confession of sin. We've been forgiven. And as a result, though there are struggles, we no longer walk in sin. We've been forgiven. We've escaped God's wrath. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself that we might have intimacy, that we might have fellowship with him. And as a result, we keep God's commandment. And the love of God is perfected in us through Jesus as we seek and desire to walk as Jesus walked. Those are truths that we should meditate on and think on every single day. Those are the truths that should, should dominate our lives, should run our lives amidst all the distractions of so many other things. Conversely, of unbelievers, the Bible is clear, and in particular these first 16 verses, three things. Number one, uh, they lie. You remember when you were an unbeliever? And you, you lied. You walked in darkness. Oh, you made truth relative. But in reality, you walked in darkness. Why? Because the word of God was not in you. You may have had a, some, some sort of an <clears throat> intellectual understanding of God's word, but it wasn't in your hearts. Consequently, unbelievers don't keep his commands. There may be some unbelievers here uh, this morning. I hope not, but... Uh, there's probably some here, and you're trying to figure this Christian thing out, this God uh, thing out, where you're going to have an opportunity to understand that. And don't be afraid of just acknowledging, you know what, I, I like darkness. I walk in darkness as we look at that, because everyone is born into darkness. They live for darkness. They walk in darkness until they're set free by Jesus Christ, who is the light, which we'll look at in more detail here in just uh, a moment. Now, John is telling us throughout, the, throughout this letter the reasons why he writes the letter. And if you look at verse 4 of chapter 1, we see the first thing, which is the reason uh, we call this series of studies the fullness of joy. He said, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Now, I hope that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that you are... Uh, living a life full of joy. I hope you have a life that's full of joy. Now, you may wake up and there may be some bad things that are going on in your life, some difficult things, but don't let those things rob you of the joy that comes in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Because James, he wrote, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials. Well, how can you count it joy when you're falling into various trials? The reason you can count it joy is, as we'll see later on in the later chapters of verse uh, 1 John, because he who lives in us, Christ, is greater than he who lives in the world. There's fullness of joy for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I hope you're walking in that. I hope that if you've come today and you're a little bit discouraged about something that's going on in your life or in work or in a relationship, that you'll put that on hold for a moment and you'll just focus on the joy that we have and the victory we have in Jesus Christ. So he tells us that he writes these things so that we may experience a fullness of joy. But then if you look in 1 John 2, verse 1, he tells us another reason why he writes. And he says, my children, I, uh, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And so in other words, he's saying is, I'm writing this because once you read this letter, you're never going to sin again. Is that what he's saying? No. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want these things to be a protection for you so that you may not sin. But then notice it goes on to say, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's not suggesting that we will never sin, but that we have the power within us to stay away from sin as we learn this 
uh, last Wednesday in 1 Corinthians 10. There, there's no temptation to sin that will come our way that God is not faithful to provide a way of escape that you might be able uh, to bear it. And so let's stand together. Let's look with these things in mind, um, the old and the new commandment, the contrast between <clears throat> darkness and, and light, what the role that love plays as our evidence, the evidence of our faith, and the reasons that John is writing this epistle specifically that we would abide in him and be protected from any sort of false teaching that might come our way. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I've written to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Lord, I pray <clears throat> for every person that's in this sanctuary this morning that you would meet us right where we are, Lord. I pray, Lord, that whatever place we're at, if we're walking in a tremendous confidence in you, I pray that you would solidify our position in you and that we would stand even firmer, abiding in you in every area of our lives. For those who are on shaky ground, Lord, they're, they're being uh, tossed by various uh, concerns of this world, I pray that their hearts and their love for you would be rekindled. For those that may not know you, I pray that they would see that you present an opportunity uh, for them to reach out to you, to turn from sin, to walk away from darkness and be ushered into the marvelous light of Christ. Oh Lord, help us to understand the depth of what John is saying here so that we might live effectively as Christians in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, people who want to try to look at the things that are going on in the world around us and uh, would suggest that uh, things aren't as bad as they seem to be or <clears throat> that things are really getting better, or whatever the case may be. And, and yet in reality, we've all heard the, uh, the uh, example of the frog in the boiling kettle. And they just turn the heat up, and little by little, the frog ends up boiling to death because he just gets comfortable. He gets oh, yeah, it's kind of cozy here. And next thing you know, you know, his eyes are bugged out, and he's completely uh, fried in, the, in this pot. And I think... I think one of the reasons why this word is so relevant to us today is because there are a lot of people today that are kind of in the kettle, so to speak. And they would say, well, you know, the world really isn't that dark. And yet, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we know that uh, uh, those who are in Christ, we see through the light of Christ, and we see that we do, in fact, live in a very dark world. We don't despair because we have Christ. But the reason that Jesus came is because people were living in darkness. 
And he came uh, not, as some would suggest, to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And he said in John chapter 3 that the condemnation of the world is that they rejected the truth, that they rejected the light. Why? Because they love darkness. Now, how many of you remember loving darkness? I, I remember it. I remember it very, very clearly. And in some respects, there are sometimes things that come our way that can even tempt us to be drawn back to some form of the darkness. Maybe not as dark as we once were, but some form of the darkness, the enemy tries to tempt us by making it still uh, attractive. I mean, all you have to do is just look and see uh, the previews of movies. Look and see the kind of movies that are coming out. Look and see the kind of things that people post on Facebook and the ads that come in. And you have to be so careful now. Why? Because there's this draw to darkness. And yet Jesus came how? He came as the light to a dark world in which we live. And it's Jesus who said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, I want you to think about this as we begin to look at our text this morning. Jesus said in John chapter 9, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As I read that recently, I thought to myself, well, Lord, we know that you're present here, but we also know that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. You're in heaven. Are we back in darkness now? Is that why the world's so dark? Because you're not here? Praise God, no, that is not the case. Because Jesus also said, and this is an exhortation to us, <clears throat> Jesus said, and in a, in a sense, John is writing the same thing. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. You realize that? You're the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he's infused in faith. He's infused his light into us, and he said, you are the light of the world. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you realize how powerful that is? that we have the opportunity to let the light of Christ so shine through our lives that people would see our good works, not motivated uh, by pleasing and satisfied God, but motivated by what He sacrificially did for us, that people would be so drawn to the light of Christ in us that they would glorify our Father in heaven. We have a, the blessed opportunity of being God's light to a dark world. And I share this because going into what we're going to learn from John, I want to ask you this question, are we taking advantage of those opportunities? Are we taking advantage of the opportunities to be light to a dark world, or are we choosing to allow the world to darken us? Remember, that Satan himself can disguise himself as what? As an angel of light. As an angel of light. And this is why John's letter is so firm. And he's warning. And he begins in verse 7 by talking about this old and new commandment. Notice verse 7. Brethren, I write no new, which is another way of saying what? Old. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard or had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him, in Christ, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, when you read these first two verses, or the first uh, verse 7 and then the first half of verse 8, it seems a little confusing because Paul's talking about an old commandment which they had from the beginning, and then notice suddenly in verse 8 he throws in there again a new commandment. 
And so just about the time we're thinking, okay, the old commandment, the old commandment, what is the old commandment? He says, again, a new commandment. What is the commandment that he's talking about? Look at chapter 3, verse 11, and he tells us, and it sets the tone for what he's going to tell us here when we get to verse 9. 1 John 3, 11, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That we should love one another. Forty-six times John will use the word love from the Greek word agape. And the commandment that has been given to us is to love one another. To love one another. We're called to love one another. In fact, in John 13, 34, the reason that uh, John uh, calls it the uh, new commandment is because Jesus referred to it as a new commandment. In John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you. He knew that he was going to go be with the Father. He knew that he was going to die for the sins of the world. And he says, I'm going to leave you a new commandment. I give to you a new commandment that you love one another. And you may think, well, I love the person. Well, then why do you not sit close to the person? Why do you go, oh, man, two chairs. It's getting a little close. Oh, wait, you know. If you, if, you, if you love, why don't you sit up front? Show the love. Sit up front in these front rows so you can be a little closer to me. You know, he says, this is how they'll know that you, that you love. This is a new commandment that you love one another. How? As I loved you. How did he love us? He went to the cross for us. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Listen, church, we are to love one another in the same manner as Jesus loved us. And Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Are we willing to lay down our life for our friends? Do we know one another well enough to know what those needs are? You know, yesterday at the men's breakfast, we broke up into five groups, and each one of the elders took a group, and we just spent uh, a good hour getting to know one another. And what's your passion? We asked one another, you know, what's your passion? And we... The only rule was you couldn't say your passion. We just assumed, let's just say that all of our passion is Jesus. Because you know how you get in those circles and you say, what's your passion? And the first one says, well, man, I really like sports. And the next person says, well, I really, my passion is Jesus. And then the first guy goes, oh, man, I can't believe. Why didn't I say Jesus? And then every person after that says Jesus. Why? Because they don't want to feel like the first guy that said sports. And so we said, let's just make the assumption that everybody's passionate about Jesus. But what are you really passionate about? And it was such a great time. We spent over an hour just getting to know one another. The Lord has really been stirring upon my heart the importance of just getting to know people. Do you realize how impersonal we've gotten? We don't sign emails anymore. I mean, emails are the equivalent of letters. Remember when you used to write a letter you know, you know, love you or whatever. There is always a closing and you sign it and everything. We don't even sign emails anymore. We come up with a shorthand for texts and a bunch of emoticons so that we can really take our relationships to a deeper level. We think somehow that the more texts that we can send out, the more emails that we get, somehow we'll be more closely bonded with one another. What would happen if we actually start writing greetings and actually signing emails with how we felt about it? Maybe that's why we don't sign them, because we don't want them to know how we really feel about them. Greater love has no one than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. This is the new commandment. This is the old commandment. Look at verse 8. As we move into what is the evidence of the commandment, 
Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. I'm sorry, before we go into the evidence of that love, let's just talk for a minute about this contrast between light and darkness. <clears throat> and I want to spend a little time here to set the stage for the evidence, our love for one another, because if we don't appreciate that we no longer live in darkness, then we're not going to pour ourselves into how we love and how we care for one another. Listen, the only reason we are capable of loving one another with any sort of consistency in a way that is a reflection of God's love for us is because we're no longer walking in darkness. Amen? We're no longer walking in darkness. Now, I think we should think every day about how glorious it is that we're no longer walking in darkness. It is one of the most glorious truths about becoming a Christian. It delivers, Christianity delivers, faith in Christ delivers a person out of darkness. That's how we come to the light, is through faith in Jesus. Jesus said he is the light of the world because he knew that the world was dark and needed the light. We read in John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, all things were made through him, through Jesus, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Oh, I love that I've been delivered from darkness. Delivered from darkness. Hold your place there and turn to John chapter 12. <clears throat> John chapter 12. It says, when Jesus, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you, referring to himself. <clears throat> Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. We live in a dark world and it wants to overtake us. And unless we understand that Jesus is the only one that delivers out of that darkness, that Jesus is the one that makes light so light and brings, sheds light on the darkness and reveals how ugly darkness can be then it will seek to overtake us. And I was thinking about this just the other, uh, <clears throat> the other night, well, just last night, as a matter of fact, Jenny was watching uh, uh, Jane Eyre. Is that what that, I think it's called Jane Eyre. I called it Jane Austen. What, so I, I'm not tracking with the whole, uh, I, I think it frustrates Jenny when I watch movies like that with her because I always come in in the middle of it and then I ask all kinds of questions to get caught up. Who's that? And she's very patient. She'll say, well, that's so-and-so. And I say, Who, who's that? And how come they're doing that? Is that because, and I'm sure she's just thinking, you know, if you want to watch the movie, why don't you come in at the very beginning of the movie? But I don't know, some of you, I'm sure all you men have seen this movie, uh, but just kidding. But as, as, uh, as she's walking in, it's dark outside. I mean, it's dark. And she walks into this big, stony, uh, stone almost like a castle, mansion, and she walks in, and it is dark, and all she's got is this little candle inside of a little lantern, and she's walking in, and I'm just thinking, and I turned to Jenny, and I said, man, can you imagine what it must have been like back then? Back then, it just, at night, once the sun goes down, you just got a little candle thing, and that's it, and everything is virtually dark. Everything is, is practically dark. And I said, you know what? They probably just got used to it, and that was light to them. And it immediately dawned on me that that's the way it is uh, with a lot of people today. They're walking around in the dark, but they're so used to it that they don't even appreciate that they're walking in the dark. And you don't appreciate how dark something is until you've exposed, been exposed to the light. Amen. Jesus is the light. Jesus said, 
in John chapter 12, I've come as a light into the, into the world that whoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. Satan, who is described as crafty, able to come in by stealth, disguised as an angel of light, has managed to creep into the church and convince people that a loving God would not send people to hell, could not condemn people, when in fact Jesus made it very clear, your words condemn you, your rejection of me condemn you, because I came as a light to expose darkness, but because people love darkness. They ran from the light. And people buy into the lie left and right because they're drawn to darkness. They reject the words of Jesus, the true light who's come in to the world. Why do you think the Apostle Paul was such a radical uh, Christian? Why do you think he went from destroying the church to, to preaching everywhere he went to deliver people from darkness? Because Jesus had told him, I'm going to send you so that you'll turn people from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God. And, and that had happened to Paul. And he was committed from that point forward. He knew that he had once been walking in darkness and after meeting Jesus, he was walking in light. Church, we need to realize what a glorious truth this is. We must walk in in the confidence that we were once in darkness and now we are in the light of Christ. What is that evidence? What is that evidence? Look at verse 9. The evidence of living in the light is how we respond to the new commandment to love one another. There's so much we could say here, but let's just sum it up this way. The sign of Christian maturity is how we are loving one another. Look at what he says in verse 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. See, if we are mature as Christian if we're loving our brothers and sisters, we're walking in the light. Now notice that John doesn't say here in verse 9 that it's based on how you're loving the world. In fact, next week we're going to read that John exhorts us that to love the world or the things of the world is an indication that God's love is not in us. He's saying the only way that people are going to know who I am, the only way that people are going to, or one of the ways that people are going to be able to glorify my name is how they see you loving one another. And if you say you love your brother and you're walking in darkness, then the love of the Father is not in you. There is darkness in you. You're stumbling in that truth. And it will be impossible to truly love one another if we're not absolutely and completely surrendered to Jesus Christ. And one of the things that impedes others coming to faith is because they see so much infighting within the church. And the enemy seeks those opportunities to stir the pot, and unfortunately, he does not have very far, have to search very far. Let me just encourage you, don't get caught up in, in these discussions on Facebook that just uh, exposes our pettiness to the, to the world. I see those things and it, 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 I, I refuse to participate. Once in a while I might send somebody a private message, but I'm not going to just throw, just expose a bunch of dirty laundry for the rest of the uh, the world to just see that and to uh, make fun of the church all, all the more. Listen to what Paul said to 1 Timothy. Teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless generations which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love. Love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. No wonder people are not attracted to the church uh, 
at large because they see so much infighting. And one of the passions of my life is to accurately represent the church which was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. To accurately reflect the church, I want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want to see people that look from a distance and say, man, I don't want to be a part of that mess. I want to see people that say, man, there is a group of people there that they're loving each other. Man, clearly they got a few issues here and there, but they work them out. They're committed to one another. They're reaching out to their neighbors and their communities in the love of Christ. Listen, we can't manufacture. If that isn't flowing out of hearts that are just completely surrendered to him, we won't be able to manufacture it. It'll come across as self-righteousness. And Jesus says, and John reiterates, love one another, love one another, genuinely love one another, and people will draw, be drawn to me out of darkness and into the light. And then finally, in verses 12 through 14, he writes uh, of a number of reasons why he's writing the epistle. And it, and it serves really, these verses really serve as reminders to us. Now there are some people who believe that John is actually addressing three different age groups in these, in these verses. Little children, fathers, and young men. But I don't believe that's the case. Because we know that John is writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians. I don't think he's making a distinction here because if you look at verse 1 of chapter 2, how does he begin? He begins, my little children. And this is his first reference to the recipient of the letter. He says, my little children, which he uses seven more times in the letter. So as we read these verses, uh, 12 through 14, don't think of it in terms, well now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an older man, so I don't have to listen here because he's talking to children, or I don't have to listen here because he's talking to a young man. No, he's talking to each of us, and I believe what he's doing is he's emphasizing a level of spiritual growth as he mentions these things. Look at verse 12. I write to you little children. And remember, we're to come to him as little children. We're to come to him as a faith of a child. I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I love that. Our sins are forgiven. Doesn't that just bring you joy as a little child? Our sins are forgiven. I write to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men. And I like how he appeals to that zeal and that confidence. I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. Not in your own strength, but in the strength of Christ. I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. Oh, how good is it, no matter what age you are, to be able to come to the Father as a little child. He says, I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. And then he says, I've written to you, young men, because you are strong because the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. You see, in Christ, we are strong. In Christ, we've overcome the wicked one. Why? Because his word abides in us. And I want to close our time by drawing our attention to the word abide in the latter part of verse 14. That word, whenever you see it in the Bible, in the New Testament, that word, it means, it, it's translated to remain, to dwell, to live. In other words, John is saying you are strong, you overcome the wicked one because the word of God dwells within you. It lives in you. It remains in you. Now, I was interested to find out how much John loved this word, this Greek word that, that 
we've translated into abide. Forty-five times we see it in the New Testament. John uses it 42 of them. 42 of them. And he uses it 21 times in 1 John alone. Now I want you to turn with me to uh, John chapter 15. The Gospel of John, he also wrote the Gospel of John. And I think one of the reasons why he used it as much as he did is because Jesus used it so often. Is because he heard Jesus use it numerous times. Right here in these 11 verses, it was used 42 times in the New Testament and Jesus uses it 10 times here in 11 verses. To remain to dwell, to live in. Look what he says, John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Then he says, abide in me. Abide in me. Remain in me, dwell in me, live in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Do you see the importance of remaining in Jesus and his word remaining in us? I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, he who remains in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. No wonder we run into difficulties. Because we try to do things without him. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, I had somebody uh, come up to me after first service, and they, they said, well, you know, I'm remaining in the Lord. I'm holding fast to the Lord, and I'm clinging to the Lord, but I'm still going through difficult times. So what's going on there? Does it mean I'm not mature in the faith? No, it means quite the contrary. When you're pressing through difficulties in the Lord, it speaks of your maturity. And don't rob yourself of the, the depth of what the Lord wants to teach you through those difficult times. Because I can tell you that some of the richest times that I've ever experienced in Jesus was in some of the darkest times that I've had in this life. And fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who has prepared a place in heaven for us, and the day is going to come when there's no more sorrow, no more tears. And we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Without me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and was withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I, I love verses like that. You know, when you first see those verses, you get really excited because you say, cool. I can get whatever I want. All I got to do is abide in him and his, his words abide in me. Good to go. I can. It's, it's easy sailing from here on out. Uh, but then when we see that that doesn't quite work out that way, then we get a little frustrated with these verses, don't we? But if we'll press through them, look at what happens. When we abide in him, when his words dwell and remain and live in us, then all we want to ask him for is what he desires. What do you want from me, Lord? Because there's nothing more important than just pleasing him. And so it's this, it's this perfect little verse that just, Lord, whatever you want. You want death? I'm good to go. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You want me in some accident or something? I'm good to go because there must be something there that you have for me to learn. He says, that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Lord, I desire whatever you want for my life. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain. Same Greek word that he's using for abide. That my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. We're going to partake of communion here and have the worship team come on up. And... But let me ask you this. You know, Paul says that we're supposed to examine our hearts. We're not to take communion if we're not a follower of Jesus Christ because it's for believers. And we're not to take communion if we're not right with the Lord. That's why he says, examine, 1 Corinthians 11, examine your heart. Because if we're not honest with the Lord and, and we take communion, he says you, you end up mocking God because you're, you're basically discounting what it is that Jesus took to the cross. What kind of worries do you have here today? What kind of concerns? What kind of things are you stressing about that Jesus took to the cross? Does God's word live in you? Does it dwell in your hearts this morning? Does it remain there? Or does it ebb and flow depending on how you're feeling in any given day? God's word must be the foundation of our hearts and our souls no matter what we're going through. It's why it's so important to read the Word and to study the Word. It's why it's so important that we, we don't leave the Word of God on the pages, but we, we take them, as it says in the prophets, that we eat the words, that we take them in, and we let them flow through our bloodstream and through our pores, and it permeates every part of our body. So that we can... Love in the manner that we've been called to love. So that we can live in the manner that we've been called to live. So that people would begin to look at our lives and they would say, what is your deal? You just got laid off. You just had a, a tragedy in your family. You, you just lost a fortune or whatever the case may be. And you can say, oh man, if you only knew who I have living in me. If you only knew the value of God's word remaining in me, you would understand that I'm not motivated by the things of this world. Does God's word live in you? Do you desire his word to remain in you? Or are you content with it ebbing and flowing based on your feelings in any given day? Don't be a fair-weather Christian. That is what John is telling us this morning.